Huh? Me? You want to know what I think of the patch? <laughs> Why, I'd be happy to tell you. So one of the main issues with Vladimir's identity previously was that he was a champion who was very unsatisfying to level. The only difference between pre and post leveled Vlad was a regen and a stat buff generic to all leveled champions, so nothing. There are quite a few problems with Vladimir as a whole, and I don't think this really solves any of the core issues. The four existing Crimson units, who are supposed to be his supporters both in fiction and in game, don't feel that tied to Vladimir. Only Disciple and Curator get value when attacking with Vlad, the other two damage units to help him level quicker, but without any of these also having regen or tough, their value alongside Vladimir feels extremely limited. On top of this, after the patch, Noxus has the most 1 health units of any region with 9. This makes Vlad feel pretty anti-synergistic with his region as a whole. Attacking with your 1 health units and Vlad feels really bad a lot more often than it feels good, and because the value generating Crimsons are so weak, they're likely to get traded onto when they attack with Vlad and don't have a great chance to get multiple procs of their effects off. Now, being realistic, we've seen two kinds of Vlad decks in the past, Demacia and Freljord. Most people in the West are familiar with Vlad Braum, and Demacia Vlad is mostly a Korean concept from what I've seen, so we'll focus on Vlad Braum. Much like how Yasuo has felt locked into Noxus, Vladimir has felt locked into Freljord. There are a lot more Freljord units that synergize with Vlad and his ability and want to get damaged. Think about Legends of Runeterra like Magic the Gathering for a second. Imagine each region as a color, and obviously we have 7 instead of 5, but bear with me for the purpose of the example here. It feels like champions like Vlad and Yasuo were designed as multicolor cards. If you think of Noxus as red and Freljord as blue, think of Vlad as a red-blue card. If you do that, I think this design makes more sense, because it doesn't feel like Vlad was designed and then we were nudged toward playing him in Freljord, it feels like he was designed to only exist in Freljord. And in that regard, I like this change a lot. Freljord Noxus decks in all varieties that I can think of off the top of my head are pretty cut and dry mid-range decks. Uh, they curve out really well, so they don't want to play something like Catalyst of Aeons. And that leaves Freljord Noxus with a very stagnant life total, especially the Vlad Brom decks whose 3-drop slot feels overloaded already and can't fit in kindly Tavern Keeper. The extra healing sure is nice, and prior to Rising Tides it felt like Vlad Brom was generally favored against Bannerman, which is sort of the niche space it felt like it existed in. This is a mid-range counter to Bannerman, and that's about it. With the addition of cards like Unyielding Spirit and, and Detain to answer other copies of Unyielding Spirit, I'm not even confident that's the case anymore. Because Vlad is a Freljord deck that doesn't run Frostbite, it doesn't do well against Unyielding Spirit, and because it doesn't run a lot of removal, Detain is extremely impactful against it. Uh, so to summarize the Vlad buff, Vlad exists in a narrow space, and his deck regional composition have a lot of glaring weaknesses. A lack of healing was one of them, and admittedly one of the bigger ones, but I don't think it's enough to impact any singular matchup in a meaningful way, especially since Rising Tides. I think if you actually want to push Vladimir into viability, we need a complete overhaul of the Crimson package similar to the Mage Seekers. Mana nerfs are about as straightforward as they get, so I feel like there's not much to say. We've seen both Ezreal and Hymer Ionia switch over to Vi more and more consistently, and I think this change continues to push that, especially for Heimerdinger decks. Because Karma 1 generates value by sitting on board, she comes down with a target on her head. And because she came down on the same turn as Heimerdinger and had the same health as him, she was a great way to bait out removal. Since the release of Rising Tides, we've seen Karma shift to a much more supportive role, really only being seen alongside Heimer, Lux, and Ezreal. We've definitely moved away from the spooky Karma decks that would use Rekindler and Mistcall to summon multiple copies of Karma and let her shine as the sole win condition. Vi was already pushing her out with Heimer, Ezreal, and even though both were nerfed, I definitely see them continuing down this path. Karma was a great turn 5 tempo play, especially if she did get to stick around and generate value, but as we all know, a lot of her power was tied to leveled up Karma. Karma 2 suffers minimally, the only major difference seems to be that you can no longer jam down Unyielding Spirit on the same turn as her, which is impactful, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, but because she was seeing play in a much more narrow range of decks than pre-Rising Tides, I don't think this is actually going to affect her play rate at all. If the numbers indicate a sharp decline in play rate from patch 1.1 to patch 1.2, I'm pretty sure that can mostly be attributed to the fact that very late in patch 1.1, Ezreal players were making the switch to Vi, and they hadn't fully finished that transition yet, uh, so it is just a natural passing of time pushing Karma out, but the nerf might accelerate that a little bit. But overall, I'm a little surprised that she got nerfed based on the narrow range that we've seen her in uh, over the course of the last last four weeks. I don't think there's ever been a popular or successful Shen deck that didn't have Fiora in it. 
Uh, when you think of Ionia, I feel like there are two major identities at play, spells and elusive units, neither of which really jive with Shen. He suffers from the same problem I mentioned earlier where he doesn't feel like an Ionia champion, but rather an Ionia Demacia champion. He's pretty pigeon held into that regional composition. Uh, Ionia is a great supporting region to round out a deck and strategy, but thanks to Unyielding Spirit, Demacia no longer needs the support. I do agree that Chen needs a buff, but an attack buff feels very aloof as to the real problems surrounding the identity of the card. Uh, this is the exact change that I had proposed, so I've kind of said my piece on this in my patch prediction video. It's nice, it felt necessary, I actually would have liked it if they had left her backside alone at 6 HP, uh, but it's not a hill I'm going to die on, I just think that the leveled Vi was fine since it can be difficult to do, especially since she lost some health, but I definitely think that this is a good change. Uh, Pre-leveled Vi was really taking over games in a massive way and getting constant 3 and 4 for 1s, uh, 2 for 1 at least most of the time. This does make it so that she dies to things like Double Grasp of the Undying, which I think is kind of where you want a 5-drop to be. So overall, this is a change that I'm very happy with because it's a change that I had proposed myself, so I'm cool with it. Hecarim's nerf had pushed his identity as the Ephemeral Champion, and unsurprisingly, that remained a pretty shitty strategy. Over the last two weeks tournaments, we've had an extremely small number of Hecarim pop up in Endorse Spiders, and I would imagine his latter success is a close mirror on this one, so I do like giving him a buff. When Hecarim was nerfed, power was taken away from the Spectral Riders, which was the most frustrating part to play against because interacting with ephemeral units feels bad, and moved to leveled up Hecarim, but because ephemeral unit strategies suck, it still took four Hecarim attacks to level him. I think there was room for him to come back, mostly thanks to Blighted Caretaker adding some ephemeral units to the mix, and honestly, I like the attack buff. Uh, Hecarim is still hard to level, and pre-level Heck is likely to be the only version of him you use in most games, and that felt really weak. Letting him beat up on Vi and Garen is really important if you do want this champion to come anywhere near the meta again. So I do like this change. Uh, 5-5s five are good. I'm not sure it's good enough for a vanilla 5-5 five five mana scout to see play, but the buff to Remembrance feels nice since Karma Lux received some incidental nerfs. I think the reasoning of moving the power from Grizzled Ranger to Great Horn Companion makes sense on paper. I don't think that this really affects the playability of the card, which previously was pretty close to zero, but the Remembrance buff is appreciated since you know you'll always get a 5 attack unit and you can play to that, but I don't think this is going to start popping up in scout decks all of a sudden. I was pretty sure Riot was going to play this one passively and only hit Badger Bear, then wait and see how that went before they hit Grizzled Ranger, but I'm definitely okay with seeing a change to Ranger as well. I think the card is still very good and will still see play in everything he saw play in before. I definitely feel like this is one of those changes where the play rate of the card is not going to change at all, just the success rate of finding the card, which previously was definitely out of line. Overall, I like the change. I'm fine with it. I feel like there's not too much to say about like an attack nerf on something like this. I feel like generally when we see a health buff push something into playability, it's when the health is bumped from 3 to 4, and that's just kind of what it takes for a card to even get experimented with. The only deck I could see this getting played in is Bannerman, and I don't think that's going to be the case. If the Shen buffs are more impactful than I give him credit for, maybe we'll see him played in some kind of Shen deck, but I really don't think this makes any change to Laurent Chevalier overall. Uh, when I did my prediction video, I think I talked for like 4 minutes about why a 3-4 bear was the change I wanted to see, and I'm not going to make you guys go through that again. So, long story short, it's kind of similar to Grizzled Ranger, where the playability shouldn't be impacted at all, the win rate might go up or down a little bit, but I do like them leaning in on the wall strategy that he's provided to Karma Lux, rather than the aggressive, the over-aggressive, rather, strategy that he applied to Bannerman. So, I like this change. So, since the release of Rising Tides, the card I've kept my eye on the most was Unyielding Spirit. Once the Rising Tides meta settled a bit, we saw Standalone move away from Ionia and branch out into other regions, because things like Solitary Monk and a flurry of buff and barrier spells were redundant thanks to Unyielding Spirit. This made Standalone decks a lot more versatile, which is a scary thing when dealing with a deck with such a linear core strategy. It seems the internal Riot data indicated that this was an issue, uh, so now if you want to play no protection outside of Standalone slash Unyielding Spirit, you have to wait until turn 4 to play your unit safely which takes you off of turn 5 spirit. You can still turn 5 spirit if you take the risk of dropping your unit on 3, standaloneing on 4, and unyielding on 5. Personally, I feel like the nerf to standalone should have been aimed at spirit itself. In the next nerf, we'll see Riot cite a high win rate for an on-curve legion rearguard as a driving factor behind the nerf, and I would have to think that on-curve unyielding creates a similarly alarming win rate, since standalone is typically the only deck to play it on-curve. They go on to say that Unyielding is on the watch list, and they felt as though upping the cost would make it just unplayable, and likely would also kill the diversity of standalone decks since you're vulnerable to removal for two turns, four and five even if you stand alone on three, which are much more impactful turns. 
Overall, while I do think unyielding is the core problem of every deck that it's in, nerfing standalone should reduce the consistency of on-curve unyielding spirit, which I think is the metric where the win rate was, un was likely over the top. So while it's not what I wanted, I'm not ready to throw a fit over it yet. I think unyielding is a problem when played off curve, but it's likely that the win rate was only oppressive when played on curve, according to internal data, so I understand why this change was made. While it doesn't, while it likely doesn't affect the win rate of on curve, it should reduce the play rate on curve, because playing a 3 drop on 3 in a Shadow Isle standalone deck offers no protection for it. So if your unit is killed, you cannot play unyielding on curve. If you play your unit on 4 and then are forced to standalone to protect it, once again you cannot unyielding on curve. If you jam a 3 drop and it dies, and then you jam another one and it lives, then you can do it. Uh, and if we move back to Ionia for more protection on 3, or add things like Prismatic Barrier to a deck to protect your Fiora on 3, then the win rate of Unyielding on 5 may go down due to a resurgence of dead draws in the deck. So overall, I think this is a change that I didn't see coming at all, but it really hit the nail on the head, at least in what I assume to be the problem of Unyielding Spirit being played on curve to an impressively high win rate. In my prediction video, I had mentioned a cost increase to Boom Crew Rookie and an attack reduction on Legion Grenadier. I seek to slow down burn, while Riot has chosen to make the deck easier to answer. It's a balanced choice I can get behind. But when buffing and nerfing cards, I feel it's important to compare them to other things of the same cost. Obviously, things don't always line up exactly, especially since they're in different regions. For example, Boom Crew Rookie and Border Lookout have the same cost and stat line, but you can't expect every card with the same cost and stat to be exactly the same power level. I feel like that's a statement that gets more and more true the higher in cost you go, and that's what makes the Legion Rearguard nerf feel pretty bad. There's not a lot that you can do with 1-drops in terms of stats and abilities, and the standard stat line for a 1-drop seems to be 3 when you combine their health and attack, and Rearguard here is going from 5 to 4. The issue is that the standard 1-drop is 3 stats and upside, and Rearguard is 4 stats with downside. Now we've got Scythria as a 4 stat vanilla, and I'm willing to say that 3 attack is an upside on its own. But Legion Rearguard to me doesn't feel on par with Scythria, he feels worse. I know that the purpose of this and the Boom Crew was to make the removal lineup easier, but nerfing, but nerfing both of the units who were safe from removal at cost I think is a little bit overkill. It can definitely get out of control when multiple, especially low cost units, can't be removed by anything of the same mana cost, but I feel like I would have liked to see one remain, and maybe that would still be too overloaded. I do agree that a Boom Crew nerf wouldn't be enough, but I think it's going to make burn significantly worse. For example, with the changes into Masia, I think you'll see almost no immediate changes to the deck, and it'll just feel a little bit weaker, but this rearguard change makes me think that a lot of burn is going to have to change. Healing is part of Freljord's regional identity. Is it though? Is it though? The newest Freljord unit to get buffed to a 3-3. This is actually pretty significant for Freljord, specifically because Trifarian Assessor is mostly found in Freljord decks, and getting your units closer to that 5 attack sweet spot so you need less Omen Hawks and Hearthguards to turn on Assessor is a welcome change. The card was already picking up play, I, I don't think this affects the play rate as much as the win rate, um, but yeah, I, I think this is fine. I don't think you need me to tell you that this card was a little much. 4 didn't feel like a bad price to pay for this effect, comparative to things like Salvage, and then the increased cost doesn't affect the play rate. Obviously going up to 3 mana from 2 seems like a Heimer buff, and it is, so hopefully that doesn't come back to bite us in the ass. I touched on the identity of making burn easier to answer a lot in the rearguard change, so I'm not going to reiterate it too much. Uh, it's fine, it, this is the one that I felt needed to happen, but I felt like Boom Crew was a great card because it was hard to answer, and that was kind of the card's whole thing. Based on the playability spikes we've seen from cards who get buffed from 3 to 4, I'm scared for Boom Crew being the pioneer of the opposite. So they mentioned specifically that this was supposed to be a buff to spider decks when Brood Awakening got buffed and it went a little over the top and spread out. Agreed. I mentioned earlier about two color champions in Runeterra, and it seems like in Riot's mind, Spiders specifically refers to a Noxus Shadow Isle deck playing spiders from both regions. Karina and Endure were clearly what they're referring to with control decks and kill your own unit combo decks, and maybe to a lesser degree Prankster, but I take issue with this stance as a whole. To me, a spider deck is something that includes what I call the spider package, Elise, Frenzied Skitterer, and Brood Awakening. This package is 9 cards, and arguably Vile Feast is in the package too, which is a quarter of your deck. 
and I think it's really cool that the package has found its way into different regions. Now, I focus more on tournament showings and results than on ladder, which means my data is going to be wildly different from what Riot has gathered, and because the grassroots tournament scene is relatively small, it's possible that a lot of tournament adaptations take longer to make it to ladder. But to cut to the mustard, the reason I mention this is because there is a version of Endorse Spiders that had already cut Brood Awakening. We'll get into the particular anecdote on Friday with Tournament Tactician, but my point is if you're wondering how Endorse Spiders are going to adapt to a Brood Awakening nerf, the answer is we'll see a spike in play rate of the Fearsome version, but overall I think players will settle back to a relatively even split of Brood and non-Brood Endure decks. Both have differing matchups, and it really matters where those matchups line up with the meta over how bad the Brood nerf felt. For Karina Control, I think they don't have a choice. Brood Awakening is the dream card for that deck. You can continue to run very little units for your Karina Veraza and still fight for board. Karina Control definitely doesn't feel like it has the same luxury as Endor Spiders, where they get a choice on whether or not they want to run Brood Awakening. The card is too core to the strategy. That said, I think there is a non-zero chance the Karina decks were due for an overhaul and Brood Awakening will push that over the edge. I don't want to get too off on a tangent, but to summarize what I just said, we've seen three Ladross become the standard for Karina decks, and with the addition of Vi, we're seeing more units in the deck, and Karina Veraza herself is getting less and less value. Having a board wiping body is great, but I feel like she's wiping less boards and getting played less often on 9 since we're up on Ledros, and Vi has done such a great job controlling boards that it's rare for you to feel like you need a board wipe on 9. The interesting part is that the Vi nerf helps Karina Veraza, and the Brood nerfs hurt her, so it'll be interesting to see how players adapt to this in the future of the deck as a whole. Chum the Waters has felt pretty unplayable since it's basically supposed to be a 4 mana removal spell that can push some damage but is vulnerable to removal. Taking low to the ground Shadow Isle removal out is a nice quality of life change, but overall I think the identity of the card just isn't the direction we see Bilgewater go in very often, and this shouldn't impact the playability too much. I don't think this also impacts Fizz's playability too much, as the problem with upgraded Fizz was that Chum the Waters is just kind of a mediocre card, and I don't think this really changes anything. I could be wrong on this one. This is probably like the one that I'm most likely to be wrong on. Making a whole ass extra baboon can't be understated. This is a pretty big buff. This, But this card still doesn't impress me. My prediction is that we'll see a massive spike in day one Bilgewater PZ burn, or just super low curve aggressive misfortune decks in general, and they'll have a massive dips in play rate throughout the week until eventually they fall off. The only question is, are they going to stick around long enough to make it into duels of Runeterra this weekend? We're giving Slotbot a simple stat boost to help get the reels spinning a bit more quickly. This card saw a lot more day one play than I expected. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I don't have a great read on this card's viability, and anything I said about it would come from a place of ignorance, so I'm actually just going to skip this one. Uh, so for Unyielding Spirit, I kind of feel like I said my piece on uh, during the standalone portion, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Uh, for Pilfered Goods and the Stealing Cards, the cards are pretty under-costed for what they do in terms of both raw cards and tempo. I get that the idea is super fun, but I do think that these are a little too efficient of a package at the moment. It's a very frustrating mechanic to play against in general, and there's nothing Riot is going to do about that, but I do think that 2 mana draw 2 is a bit too much in terms of raw cards for cost, and with a Black Market Merchant out, I do think it's arguably oppressive. On a separate but similar point, I think it's pretty wild that Yordle Grifter... Uh, is the only Allegiance card in the game that does something if you miss the Allegiance trigger, and that something is create an enabler for the other two cards in his package. That seems like a bit much to me. My main issue with the Nexus health has always been centered around Commander Ledros rather than the burn spells that came out in Rising Tides. It felt weird to me that one unit uncontested uh, and a keyword that helps him go uncontested can deal 19 damage just from play and attack with no extra steps, barriers, or setup, but ultimately I don't see them doing anything to the Nexus health. This feels more like a public relations stunt to me. I talked a lot about Ezreal in my prediction video, and my fears feel like they came true here with Ezreal coming out as a big winner for the patch. Burn became more vulnerable to his removal, which makes his matchup into those decks a lot more comfortable, and as I mentioned earlier in this video, we're seeing a trend away from Karma Ezreal and a bit more toward Vi Ezreal, so it's strange to me that they lumped both of them together. Here's a whole separate issue and why I value tournament results, even though the scene is astronomically small in the grand scheme of things, and why I think Riot would be missing out on a lot if they're not looking at tournament results, which the lack of Ezreal change makes me feel. Now these tournaments are only from North America and Europe, so we've already got a lot of bias. I do watch Korean tournaments when I can, and I haven't seen anything that wildly contradicts the data from North America and Europe, so bear with me here, as this relates to an issue that we would need a patch to fix. 
If you've looked at the leaderboards, you notice the top 5 to 10 are pretty static. Once you hit rank 1 on ladder, you're not very incentivized to play to hold on to the spot because it's really hard to lose. Uh, Mago GX had made a tweet a while ago saying that they had entered Masters at rank 2 and haven't played since hitting it, and here we see they still hold the number 2 spot. That's an issue. I'm in a similar boat. I came into Masters two or three weeks ago, and I came in at rank 48, and I haven't played a rank game on my account since then. In that time, I've climbed over 10 ranks, uh, in the t and here I am at rank 36, uh, which in the top 50 can be a bit of a task, and I've done that by AFKing. Uh, I peaked at 33, I've been hovering around there for a few days as less and less people in the top 50 try their hand at the ladder, uh, and without a tournament scene, being rank 1 grants you bragging rights and a little bit of clout, but it's hard to obtain, and without a concrete reward attached to it, like invitational tournaments with high prizes for top X players on ladder, or at the very least a visible MMR system to, now, uh, to know how close you are to actually overtaking the top spot, the reward of going for rank 1 doesn't balance out with the risk of tanking your rating. And it is worth noting that since rank 1 means very little, you shouldn't be afraid to tank your rating because your place on the master ladder means very little as long as you're here, but my point is, if the top percentage of ladder is stagnant, it means that none of your players are playing games, and this means you gather no internal data from the top percentile of your player base, which is generally where you get the best and in mo most impactful data to put your balance in to see if something is really a problem or if an issue is only for lower ranked players. However, these players are still playing in weekly tournaments. The current tournament scene, as many asterisks and grains of salt as you have to take the results with, is currently Riot's best avenue for gathering data from top players, and I think we'd be better off if Riot simply integrated their League and TFT ranked system. As much as I think Grandmaster and Challenger are relevant, it feels weird that you move from an LP-based divisional system to just your place on a ladder. I'd like a shift back to LP like they do for their other games, as much as, uh, as it makes it much more clear how far and close you are from rank 1, and should fix the issue of stagnation for the purpose of holding your place on ladder. I came in at rank 48, but theoretically I would have come in at 0 LP and would get passed by everybody who came in and played games. Now, I understand why this wasn't the case from the get-go. There are a lot of inherent differences between a 5 versus 5, an 8-man free-for-all, and a 1v1 in terms of rank progression. In League, much of your LP that you gain-lose is generally dependent on the rank of your teammates and allies, or the ranks of your opponents, and in teamfight tactics, it's based upon your placement from 8th to 1st. In a 1v1 setting, there are only three factors. Your rank, your opponent's rank, and whether or not you won or lost. But don't worry, I have all the answers laid out on how to fix this, which I will do for you now. It's like, there's probably a whole job at Riot with a 50k salary revolved around figuring out how the rank system and how to balance it, and you think that in this patch rundown video, I'm going to solve the whole problem for free and then tell you about it? Miss me with that bullshit.